Go corral them and tell them we're starting. Jeff, whenever we're out? Okay. All right. Um, need my glasses. So um, uh, Daniel Greenstein is here uh, with us for, uh, for the next session of the day, and um, he is the Director of Education and Post-Secondary Success at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in their um, U.S. program. And I am so pleased and delighted that you, you know, left your kids <laughs> and <laughs> winged your way over here and then are turning around and going back right away. And I'm just so very happy to welcome you to New York and uh, to this conference and to say thank you for coming. Thank you. It's actually, it's actually home to New York, um, as we'll see in the upcoming remarks. This is going to be a really throwback kind of you know, lecture. Here we are talking about online learning, and I'm doing a kind of um, standard lecture. But um, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, so good afternoon. I uh, am just now emerging uh, from a process that may be familiar to many of you. Um, my eldest is headed to college uh, in the fall after several years of preparing for admissions and evaluating the costs and the value of the different educational options that he has in front of him. And ironically, I'm finding that many of the issues that I sort of deal with on a day-to-day -day basis from my perch, the Gates Foundation, have found their way to my dining room table. <laughs> so during the process, I've been struck by how much our expectations of higher education have changed in a relatively short period of time. So a personal story. I grew up in Rochester, New York, feeder high school to the Monroe Community College and to the SUNY Geneseo. Um, and I was at the tail end of the baby boomer. Oh, and uh, I occasionally spent time on, at the Finger Lakes driving by the community college of the Finger Lakes. <laughs> um, so I grew up at tail end of the baby boom generation, and I attended a large, diverse urban public high school in Rochester in which the majority of the students qualified for a free or reduced lunch. So maybe 20 or 30 of us in a graduating class of 350 went on to a four-year college. About 40 of us went on to Monroe Community College. Going to college then was the exception. It wasn't the rule. The vast majority of the kids in my class, they went to work at places like Kodak or Xerox or in decent semi-skilled or manual jobs, jobs that at that time afforded their entry into the middle class. So we flash forward one generation and the world is fundamentally different. The jobs for high school graduates at Kodak and Xerox, they're pretty much gone. The high school education alone is no longer a ticket to the middle class. It's a ticket, it's a sentence to the minimum wage. And in survey after survey, for this reason, we see that the vast majority of parents, rich and poor, black, white, and brown, they recognize that higher education is the surest route into the middle class, and they see it in their children's future. So I see this in my son's experience, too. In Seattle, He's also attending a large, diverse urban public high school where a majority of students qualify for a free or reduced lunch. And at his freshman orientation, I remember looking on at him, sitting on the bleachers with 450 of his new classmates, and a high school counselor walks in and he asks the kids, how many of you are going to college when you graduate from high school? What happens? They all raise their hand. Virtually all of them raise their hand. And that happens in high school after high school across this country, except perhaps in areas in southwest Texas, which we could go into. Um, because that's their aspiration. It's a part of their American dream. And that aspiration grows out of one of the greatest success stories in American history. Faced with unprecedented opportunities and threats we, as a nation, we opened the doors of public higher education to millions of Americans. States, including New York State, built scores of new campuses to serve those students. In short, higher education became a bridge to opportunity, and we as a country, we built a new middle class. 
And I'm encouraged by the progress we've made as a nation. I'm in awe of the progress we have made in the nation since that time. That progress is evident in the diversity of our student body, which is evolving rapidly to more closely reflect the diverse people of this great country. And our progress is apparent in the success of our efforts to guide more of those students, not just into college, but to the completion of a certificate or a degree. Our progress is evident in the fact that college access and college completion have emerged as key issues on the national agenda. Who would have thought that even a decade ago that the President of the United States would call us to action on college attainment? Or that presidential candidates would offer competing visions of higher education. At the same time, our progress with our access agenda has brought us to a fork in the road. Demand for education after high school has never been greater. By 2025, two-thirds of the jobs in this country will require education after high school. Today, how many adults have a post-high school certificate or degree? 40%. There's a new majority of students on our campus at the same time. The days where the average college student, and you know this, is 18, living on campus, going to school for four years, they're long behind us. Today, the majority of our students, they work while they're going to college, many of them full time. Four in 10 of our students are 25 years old or older. And together with the first generation college goers and the low income and non-white students, they are the face of higher education today. They're students like students I've met this past year. Catherine, a sophomore at Johnson C. Smith University in North Carolina. Catherine's overcome enormously long odds as a foster child to even make it into college. But she did make it into college. And she's now thriving because of the mentoring and the support that she's finding there. There are students like Sean, a Native American, who is studying at the Rio Salado College in Arizona. Sean came back to college after dropping out and enduring a series of low-paying jobs. He's balancing his studies with the responsibility of fatherhood, his job, which makes the flexibility of Rio Salado, largely online community college, a good fit for him. But while the face of our student body has changed a lot, the educational experience that we offer them hasn't much. That's at least part of the reason why nearly half the students who begin college in this country fail to complete it. The system as a whole is not built for students like Catherine and Sean. So we have to do much better in meeting today's students, where they are, helping them to get to what's next in their lives. This new student majority brings high, but as you know, often fragile aspirations into our colleges. And too often, our colleges are not equipped to meet them. And meeting them where they are, it's not just about equity. It's an economic issue as well. Our nation's workforce will require 11 million more credentialed workers by 2025. 11 million more credentialed workers than our colleges and universities are capable of producing at current rates and respecting current estimates about growth. For the statisticians amongst us, that's a 4.5% or 5% compound annual growth rate in the number of credentials produced by every college across this nation. And if you look at the New York State workforce requirements, that 45 to 5% is very much alive here in this room. How many of you are associated with institutions which are planning today and actively producing today more 5% more credentials year on year for the next 10 years? I've never asked this question. Once I asked this question and got a hand, it was Western Governors University. That's a problem. Meeting that need is going to require a both and approach. We both need to enroll more students and we need to graduate more of the ones who already attend. 
especially those in this new student majority. Meeting that need is also going to demand that we face a very inconvenient truth. Today, educational opportunity and attainment is correlated with socioeconomic status. Higher education, once heralded for its potential as a great equalizer, is increasingly reproducing privilege in our country. Those in the top economic quartile who have a post-secondary degree stand at 90%. The lowest quartile, 8%. Today, a low-income student has a 10% chance of acquiring a college degree by age 24. 90% in the top quartile. 10% chance for a low-income student of acquiring a college degree by age 24. That's unacceptable. And these are more than just numbers. They represent people like Catherine and Sean. They represent decisions with consequences, decisions that we take with consequences. Where's the nation going to get the talent that it needs for a knowledge-driven economy? What will the widening rift between the haves and the have-nots mean for social cohesion, particularly apparent today in an election contest which is incredibly division, divisive? The bridge to opportunity that is higher education has become too narrow, too hard to navigate with a toll that is too high for too many. And we have reached a time for decisions a time for choice about how and for whom we deliver, we fund, and we measure higher education. Those decisions, decisions that you will take or not on a day-to-day -day basis, will have a real impact on the America we see, on the New York that we see in 2025. Higher education will either serve as a bridge to opportunity and a better life for more New Yorkers, or it will stand as a barrier to opportunity, reinforcing privilege and driving a wedge between the haves and the have-nots. So I'm a historian by training, so I'm more familiar with looking back than looking forward. In fact, looking forward fills me with horror. But the trend lines are clear, and if we fail to consider the possible outcomes of our action or our inaction, we will be shaped by our future rather than shaping it. So I see two New Yorks. I see two scenarios for New York looking ahead to 2025. One in which we have met our higher education opportunities and our challenges with innovation and a commitment to quality and equity, and one in which we haven't. We've allowed self-satisfaction and the politics of the status quo to prevail at the expense of economic development and social mobility. In the optimistic scenario, a majority of, Amer of New Yorkers have a post-high school certificate or degree. There's no gap between what our higher education system produces and what our workforce needs. And race and income and gender and zip code, they're no longer, as they are today, predictors of achievement in higher education. Where will that leave us as a nation? Where will that leave us as New Yorkers? It will leave us as healthier, stronger, more engaged, and less saddled with debt because all of those things are associated with increased educational attainment and employment. So now for the other scenario. It's one in which 2025 arrives and our post-high school attainment rate hasn't budged to more than 40% where it is today. Employers with high-skilled jobs, they're so desperate for workers to fill those jobs that they move their operations across state lines or to other countries, as they are doing today. The likelihood of getting a certificate or a degree depends more than ever on your race, your gender, your income, and your zip code. And the consequences, we will be a poorer and weaker state with more New Yorkers underemployed and scrambling to make ends meet, less engaged, deeper in debt, more divided. So some of you may be thinking that I've just painted an excessively positive scenario on the one hand and a rather harsh one on the other, and perhaps I have. 
But those scenarios are rooted in today's realities. Our economy is changing, the face of our society is changing, and a higher education system that celebrates who it keeps out as much as who, as much as who it lets in won't cut it in the world that's unfolding. So how do we navigate towards that more op optimistic path? So there are no silver bullets. There's no simple answers when it comes to basically transforming higher education. But years of work and research and trial and error, some of it with those of you in this room, underscore two imperatives that m we must meet in higher education for it to remain a bridge to opportunity. One is the need to dramatically increase student success rates, especially for the new majority of students that I described earlier. In campuses and systems that are making real strides in this area, they will be the first to admit that the changes that are required are fundamental, they are structural, they are operational, and they are cultural. But the other imperative is that we introduce these changes in ways that ensure the long-range financial viability of the campuses that are changing, or the system in this case. Let's face it, demand for higher education is not perfectly inelastic, and public funding will be constrained for the foreseeable future. And we can't simply keep pumping up tuition, I know not in New York because of the certain controls that are exercised upon it, at the rates that have applied over the past two decades. Something has to give. So we must look carefully and creatively at the revenue and the spending sides of the ledger. So what we're seeing in institutions that are really making the most progress in ensuring their students succeed in the completion agenda, in graduating more majority, new majority students with affordable quality credentials, we're seeing that they have tied their completion agenda directly to their long range, analytically modeled, and I'm going to call it this, business plan. I sometimes say when it costs more to lose a student than to keep the student, you keep the student. Innovative innovators, leaders, front runners in higher education that are knitting together their completion and sustainability agenda, what are they doing? They're integrating in some combination at least four things. One of them you're very familiar with. They are making teaching and learning smarter using technology. Technology, as we've already heard, isn't replacing the human element of learning, but it is enhancing it. In blended courses, the University of Central Florida is seeing better student performance than in comparable on-ground courses, consistently better in 20 years' worth of data. Using adaptive courseware, faculty at Florida International University are figuring out exactly where their students need assistance and faculty are targeting extra support to those areas. At the University of Maryland system, we're seeing that effect sizes across all student groups in blended adaptive courses up to 0.37, which basically means they are doubling the chance that a student will complete a course. And while it's early days, we're seeing how courseware not only improves student outcomes, it also introduces efficiencies that help an institution tie its completion agenda to its sustainability. University of Central Florida, online learning didn't do anything to change the operating costs of instruction. But the campus was able to deliver better student outcomes and grow its student enrollments by 30,000 undergraduate FTE, thereby increasing enrollment-driven revenues. And the capital expenditure required to do that was $20 million. To have accommodated an additional 30,000 annual undergraduate enrollments in an on-ground environment would have cost them just south of $400 million. Technology is also being used to guide students along their educational journeys by connecting different parts of the campus through integrated planning and advising services. We call them IPASS. Colleges and universities are providing more and better just-in-time support to students, to faculty members, to advisors, and to, stu and to uh, student service professionals. 
Imagine if a student could pull up an online dashboard that tracks their progress through their program, provides benchmark data about students like them and how they are doing, and raises flags on things such as missed registration or financial aid deadlines. Imagine if that student advisor could view the same dashboard to provide virtual, real-time guidance because, because of the work of providers like Civitas, Hobson Starfish, EAB, a handful of others, and some very good homegrown solutions. We don't have to imagine. This stuff is real. It's happening now. And it's happening in ways, again, that contribute directly to an institution's financial viability. Predictive analytics in advising aren't just driving student retention, and they are by double digits. They enable retention of tuition dollars. Delaware State University has modeled this to a T, demonstrating what retention levels they need to achieve in order to remain financially viable without driving up student tuition. And they serve very low income and fragile at-risk students. Completion agenda tied to a very capable and analytically driven financial model. <clears throat> Second, we make the road to a certificate and degree simpler and shorter for students by giving them clearer pathways to and through college. Our students, especially those in the new majority, they come to us through many doors. Some of them are not completely ready for college level work. Some of them do not come directly from high school. Some come with credits from one or more institutions. They need help plotting their course. And too many times we have failed them, effectively handing them a catalog and saying good luck. Or placing them in courses that neither helped nor counted. Or forcing them sometimes to retake courses they've already taken simply because the credits were being transferred. And just like the GPS in our cars and on our smartphone can give us multiple routes to the same destination, factoring in traffic and even weather conditions, we have the opportunity with today's technology and we have the responsibility with today's technology to provide similar supports to our students. We can do this by redesigning remedial education courses, which I know is an active activity here. Uh, remedial education has been the road out of college for too many students for too long. Work done by our partners at Complete College America to combine remedial and credit-bearing work into a single course, co-rec model is showing real results. Pass rates at places like Austin P University at Tennessee are doubling. Uh, and when students pass those early classes, they are far more likely, the data show us, to graduate. We can also do this by creating flexible but focused maps for students to follow in building their programs of study. So yes, college is about exploration, but getting lost in an exploration, and too many of our students do, is not what college ought to be about. We can also do this by adopting and implementing credit transfer policies that reduce the amount of rework that students have to do when they change institutions. Nearly 40% of all students who graduate with a BA degree attend more than one institution along the way. Some of them, in transferring credits, lose a semester or more at considerable cost. The current state is not just unfortunate, it's unfair. And once more, we're seeing in the most advanced institutions how the cost of acquiring and installing that GPS, a cost that frankly is often paid in terms of hiring more advisors, is more than offset by the gains that are measured in terms of student revenue retention. Miami-Dade College is also poised to demonstrate that its data systems that enable and support these kinds of analytics, these kinds of GPS, coupled with these highly structured pathways, enable them to break one and two and three terms out, how many sections of any particular course that are going to require. They can predict their capacity planning needs in terms of section sizes, faculty and adjuncts, uh, classrooms. They can optimize around those things in order not just to drive retention improvement, but to introduce efficiencies into the way they operate. So third, we can empower students, educators, and policymakers with better data for decision making. 
Higher education is a half trillion dollar enterprise in this country. And yet there are critical questions that we can't answer because the data aren't available or they don't exist. A low income student can easily figure out their odds of winning Powerball, but not their odds of graduating college. It just doesn't make sense. So, fortunately, leading states, institutions, associations have created improved measures of student progress and outcomes and institutional performance through a range of voluntary efforts. So now it's time to build on those efforts, to build on that work and make sure that we have basic information about access, progress, completion, post-college outcome, and costs for all students and all institutions. To realize that goal, we're going to have to modernize and better connect our data and our data systems at the campus level, at the state level, at the federal level. And several of our key partners are already exploring options for doing this. The payoff of having and using better data is real. It drives the analyses of where students are falling away and why. And it enables, enables, and it enables all of the institutions I've mentioned previously to tie their completion and their sustainability agenda together. So fourth, and finally, we can get more students to and through college with better financial aid. This starts with simplifying the aid application process, which stands as a barrier, we reckon, for two million students a year. Two million students who would otherwise be eligible financial aid do not get it because the application process is too complicated. Actually, 2 million students, even graduating at today's rate for low-income students, adds significantly to that 11 million number, just solving that one problem. The good news is we're seeing, starting to see progress here. Students will no longer have to apply for federal financial aid uh, because of a new rule that allows them to use prior, prior year. They'll have longer to apply for federal financial aid because they can use prior, prior tax year data, and there are standalone bills being considered in the Congress, which will simplify and reduce the number of questions. So we're hopeful that 2016, even though it may not produce a higher education reauthorization, might actually produce significant simplification of the FAFSA. And we're also seeing promise in timely distribution of emergency aid as a means of keeping students in college um, when they find themselves with a flat tire or in need of a small injection of money. So what will it take to succeed? It will take integration of all of these things. All of these things I've just named individually, they're incredibly powerful. But the real power is in their intersection. We see this, at, again, the institutions I've mentioned, but we see it perhaps most clearly at Georgia State University, an urban institution that has eliminated attainment gaps between rich and poor, between black, white, and brown. Eliminated, not reduced, eliminated attainment gaps. They started with data which led them to pinpoint their retention problems and opened up a conversation about solutions, which led them to integrated planning and advising systems for students, which led them to emergency aid programs as a means of helping students who were struggling with small financial uh, crises. It will take a laser-like focus. We can't pilot our way to closing the kinds of gaps we're talking about, whether between income, race, and gender, or between the gaps in what our economy requires in terms of uh, degree um, college graduates and the number of graduates we're producing. We can't pilot our way out of this problem. And this is tough for higher education, which cultu culturally needs to reinvent all of its solutions one campus at a time. You can imagine my colleagues at the Gates Foundation who work on the global health side, they're appalled by this. They, they ima imagine what their world would look like if every hospital had to run its own drug trials on the latest miracle drug. It doesn't make sense. And it will take a sense of urgency for action. The new majority of students is already on our campuses. They're already making our way to our campuses. Students like Catherine and Sean don't have time to lose, and they're counting on us, on all of us. It will take desire by institutions to find affordable, sustainable models for offering high-quality education to today's students recognizing that education is going to look a whole lot different than the one we have known and loved. And it's going to take an unyielding commitment to equity, closing gaps in educational access and success, 
is an economic necessity and a moral imperative. And that work needs to permeate every nook and cranny of our institutions. I think, actually, it will take a movement to widen and strengthen higher education as the bridge to opportunity, to make it more accessible and more navigable, which is why I'm actually really excited by the energy that's shown in this room and by all of you who are gathered here. And it leads me to a final question, which is, are you ready to join or even lead that movement? What does that mean? It means sending a clear message, I mentioned earlier, that we as a nation are at a fork in a road. We as a state are at a fork in the road when it comes to higher education. We either innovate and make hard choices that are necessary to expand opportunity and increase student success, or we will watch higher education become a wedge between the haves and the have-nots. It means redefining prestige in terms of how many students make it onto and across the bridge rather than how many we turn away. In other words, it means measuring our success not in terms of who we exclude, but in terms of who we include and how well they succeed. It means pursuing aggressive goals for sustainably increasing student access and success, implementing proven solutions at scale in order to achieve them. I'm talking about eliminating, not reducing attainment gaps. I'm talking about reaching tens and even hundreds of thousands, not hundreds, of students with proven innovation. Many institutions are not prepared to answer this call. Perhaps they can sustain themselves on endowment funds or on high fee, high aid models or by attracting more and more out-of-state students. But many are answering the call because they have to, because their futures and the futures of their communities and the new majority of students that they serve depend on it. Our vision is that those who do answer the call will serve as beacons for others who wish to follow, sparking an interaction effect that will transform this industry for the benefit of our students and for the good of the state and our country. The road to 2025 will not be paved with bold proclamations from people like me. It will be paved with the actions and the choices that you and your institutions take every day that reflect your data, that reflect your values, and that reflect your priorities. And they will draw on your extensive and distinctive expertise that you have and that you bring. While still only three years old, Open SUNY, or I guess it's Open SUNY 2.0 as of yesterday, it's good, provides an enormous opportunity for people across the SUNY system to stand up and through their actions to choose and to choose the path to a more equitable, a more just, healthier, and more successful society. Why Open SUNY? Open SUNY, well, I think of it kind of as a platform, probably not the right word, with the potential to combine courseware, GPS, and to leverage data in ways that can improve student outcomes, bolster quality, and with due attention to data and to execution, secure a more stable, a sustainable future for the system, its campuses, its students, and the state. Leveraging the power and the promise of this great system, Open SUNY seems to me to have the potential to enable campuses to do something they couldn't do as cost effectively or as quickly on their own. And I could actually, I will sit here and pencil out the numbers with anyone who wants to contest that proposition. Open SUNY potentially enables campuses not only to catch up with the front runners that are in the race transforming higher education into an engine of economic development and social mobility, but potentially, eventually, to surpass and to lead them. As I noted earlier, I'm a historian by training, and I've observed in my study that moments of true transformation are all about convergence, the combination of people, ideas, and time. I believe that we have the people. I believe that we have the ideas. And I believe that now is the time. So choose. Please choose wisely. The state and the nation 
need you to do that. So thank you very much. And I can take it. Questions for Daniel? Hi. Um, I'm aware of two instances historically of uh, education leading a societal transformation or education going through a huge transformation like you're talking about. One of them is the United States after World War II with the GI Bill, and the other is Europe, Western Europe, in the same time frame um, with a great deal of governmental support. Is there? Are you aware of any historical examples of educational institutions operating as private business enterprises with consumers um, being able to pull off a transformation like you're talking about? Without the level of support, it's actually an interesting debate I just had with respect to the health industry because it has recently been through a um, massive transformation. And the question that I was asked by people who are very active in guiding that transformation said, what are the incentives? And, you know, I talked about financial aid and um, accountability and uh, and they talked about Medicare and Medicaid and they said they're weak, in, weak incentives in higher education. Um, so the answer, I think, to your question is yes, while we can point to instances of private institutions doing phenomenally interesting things, even with um, federal financial aid dollars being relatively restricted and not rising at the rate of um, uh, inflation, I think we're going to have, frankly, to embrace the fact that public revenues, which are, not, which are already constrained, are going to become more constrained as public pensions come under enormous pressure. And as K-12 budgets claim the lion's share of available education funding. But it's not about whether it's possible or not. It's about what are the consequences for our not trying. This is not about not advocating for greater public investment. Of course we advocate for greater public investment. And when we get more public money, we will know how to spend it. But what is plan B? And I would conjecture <laughs> that aside from maybe a dozen or two dozen institutions, we don't have one, and our nation is at risk as a result. So I think that is the compelling nature of this challenge, and I do think it's soluble. And probably uh, 150 years ago, there's a, another transformation. Um, at that point, two thirds of jobs required a high school diploma, and progressive educators came together and realized we have to make high school free. Fast forward to today, we have. Barack Obama saying community colleges should be free. We have Bernie Sanders saying all colleges should be free. What would you say to those who argue that this is not a matter of constrained resources and finances, it's a matter of prioritization and allocation of resources in different directions? And should Bernie Sanders become president with an agenda to make college free, wouldn't that be a parallel similar to when we made high school free, when the demands of the economy made high, universal high school necessary. Yeah, and we have a really interesting debate about free college and whether or not it solves a real problem for low-income students. I mean, there's a real debate to be had. And, you know, if you do the numbers, low-income students, because they're access to Pell Grants and loans, their tuition is largely taken care of. So what does free community college do, and to what social groups does it? I'm not, and I'm not taking a point of view. I'm just repeating analysis that you I, and I, I have both I, seen. I think you're playing both sides of the street, saying students are coming out you know, in major debt, a trillion dollars in debt by last count, and that their tuition's free. It can't be both ways. So I don't want to get into the community college's free debate. There is a debate to be had about whether the free community college does, in fact, solve the problem that we're talking about. I think it's a good debate to have. It's an important one. But I still think it, the answer that I gave before is the same answer. It is about political will. You're absolutely right. Political will and political priorities. My understanding is that state revenues and federal revenues are, A, significantly constrained. They will become more constrained with health care and pension costs, that higher education is not a high priority. And I just, I'm a pragmatist. I can be an aspirational and wistful thinking, but I am a pragmatist, and my care is for students. And then I look at places like Delaware State University or Miami-Dade College or Rio Salado College, all of which are public institutions which are substantially more revenue constrained than any SUNY institution. And they are 
far exceeding expectations with respect. If you do input adjusted measures of how well their students perform. So while we're advocating for public investment, shouldn't we think also about Sean and Catherine and the millions of other students like them and ask ourselves the audacious question, is it really true that we can do no more for those kids while we wait? Again, plan A, I know what plan A is and I know how we'd spend the money. I don't see plan B and I think we need one. So two things came to mind looking at this whole uh, situation. Uh, going back to the badging discussion that we had before, do you see this whole situation as sort of minimizing the need or the value of a college education for the next generation coming through? And number two, do you see uh, the availability of free education like Khan Academy and all the open courses, the MOOCs and everything else, filling in? this gap anywhere. For years, I've been pointing my community college students to those resources, and yeah. they do use them. Yeah. Um, so between that and badging, perhaps the crisis that you're predicting, which is very dire, might not happen in that way. Maybe the, the, the big move will be more towards these other self-guided resources. Yeah, and these are the kind of innovative solutions I think we're going to have to continue to look at and evaluate. Our work at the foundation is to identify innovations and then research the heck out of them so you get a sense of what works for whom and why and how much is you know, what, what the real effect sizes are. Um, uh, you know, badging is really interesting. Micro-credentialing is really interesting. If you think about it and you think people talk about stackable credentials over a lifetime of learning, you're really amortizing the cost of education. You're, it, it, uh, honest, it allows us to raise the cost of education and just amortize it over a lifetime. So that could be a good thing, but let's address it for what it is. Um, uh, it's also super hard because we haven't really nailed assessment of competency. So if I encounter in my institution a student who received a badge in yours, how do I know that student mastered the skills that I care about? So, I mean, I think these are tractable problems, but it really gets at forms of assessment, which it really gets at our creating a, a, a free market or a currency in assessment that we can all agree to understand together. So credits or badges transfer really well. Um, but these are exactly the kinds of innovations that I think we're going to need to explore. Um, uh, and they do, they do a number of things, right? They um, give students incremental opportunities to improve their life circumstances while progressively improving their, investing in their human capital and their education. That seems to be a good thing. It was a very inspirational speech, but in some ways, and I say this with all due respect, you're kind of preaching to the converted. Um, Everyone that's in this room is on the forefront of trying to provide, you know, um, open educational resources and access to all sorts of students, and that's our mission. I, I would say it's probably to a, a to a person in this uh, room. Um, my question has more to do with the fact that what do we do when we have these lofty goals, and they're they're not lofty, but the problem is that our institutions don't give us adequate support, not just financial resources, but that there's absolutely no prestige uh, given to work online. Um, I, I'm my own department. I'm in an art department. And as the art historian, I'm already the redheaded stepchild because I'm with studio uh, you know, creators, makers. And then the fact that I offer this online class to general education students they see as, you know, kind of fluff. They think it's not worth anything. And that's my own department, you know, despite the revenue it's bringing them. And so what suggestions do you have for changing the mindset of not the general public, because I think they're behind us, but the people who are in charge? Yeah, there's an interesting question about the general public. The data that I see suggests the data public, the general public is losing faith in the higher education, in higher education. The, no, the but, but they, I mean, they're the behind the online learning. They're oh, be you mean, in, in, in not opposed to it, is that what you They're not saying? opposed to it, right. It's, it happens to be our administrators, yeah. our other faculty members, yeah. um, and, you know, the continuing model of higher education as an ivory tower in a place where you play rugby and, you know, you have rock climbing walls and Starbucks on your campus. So this is where I'm super keen on data. Maybe it's just because I'm a geek. Uh, and I'll admit that. 
uh, because in my experience in countless institutions and actually states, when you begin to pull the data together and look longer term at cost revenues and student outcomes, it is undeniable where we are. And it is undeniable that we need to make profound shifts in order to make those changes. And there are institutions, I mentioned a bunch of them, which are developing some pretty sophisticated models with their faculty, sharing with the faculty, not saying, administrators, this is what we have to do, folks, but saying, shit, here's a problem. How do we enlist the intelligence in the collective faculty to solve it? Um, so I think the ideological and inspirational discussions can only get you so far. I think when you begin to pull the analytics together, so, and I would, I would say, and you're doing great work, so don't take anything, um, what I'm about to say is criti criticism, it's not intended as that. But I would actually challenge you to do the math on the model that you're deploying in terms of cost per student credit hour, right? Um, because I think, I don't know what you'll find, but I would, you know, so what I understand you're doing, I was just listening and I did a little browsing around, the opportunity to generate new revenues by going after mostly post-baccalaureate certificates, et cetera, great thing, don't stop doing it, revenues are important, but the real pain point is the, under, is the cost, is, is how do you break out of what they call the iron triangle, the cost and quality uh, of the undergraduate education. And I'm not, I don't know the answer to this question, but I'm not certain that the answer is taking in, so we have a model where individual faculty manage their own courses. Now doing that online, I'm not sure that actually, I'm sure it improves learning outcomes or it can improve learning outcomes where it's done well. I'm not sure, and that's why I kept coming back to sustainability. I'm not sure it actually addresses that other challenge. And so the real, I think the real challenge that we face is what are the incentive structures and educational delivery models that allow us to leverage technology delivering the highest possible outcome at a cost that we can, at a cost that our revenues can afford. And so I would challenge you to think about this. Why, I, frankly, I'm so excited about the potential for Open SUNY because when, if done really, really well, and there's an opportunity for real leadership here, if done really, really well, it potentially reduces, not in a bad way, reduces the cost to individual faculty of getting the gains that you're getting in the art history department. But I would want to see that, I mean, I'm really a data-driven guy, and I would want to see that on paper rather than ideologically. You know, the debate that you're referring to in your department, and I've seen this up close and personal, it's a different discussion when the data are there. Meaning reasonable people can disagree about interpretation, they can disagree about methodology, and they will disagree about methodology, and then they'll get into the ad hominem, but eventually you have to, the data force a real focus on the problem. And incentive structures, the such that you're talking about, the reward structures, they're really hard to talk about in the abstract. Much, m it's never easy. Maybe better facilitated with a data-driven discussion that says, here's a problem, here are the costs, here are our revenues, how are, we going to ch how are we going to change this, and let's have an honest debate. Recognize that you have the power of a platform that very few others have. I mean, I know it's in development and there's a lot of stuff to do, but. Question. Yeah. I mean, uh, sorry. That really triggered something when you're talking about, oops, sorry. That really triggered something. I'm sitting here and, you know, coming out of the discussion since yesterday. We were talking a lot of innovations and, you know, we are so happy with a lot of things. And I'm here. I'm a director of distance learning. I have done training of more than 100 faculty, developed more than 100 courses, and migrated Angel to Blackboard. And I really don't know what's happening to the courses. You don't know what's happening to the? To the courses in terms of, and I totally agree with you, I've been pushing Starfish for the longest time. I've been waiting for Starfish to happen. I've, I'm trying to find ways and means. My supervisor is very much sold with Starfish. But then again, you're looking at 
I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as I sit here and I've been contemplating on this, how do I go back to these courses? How do I know what's going on? And this is really a challenge that I'm giving to Cody. And I think this is honestly, I think you've nailed your collective challenge and far yeah, be it for because me to point it out. You, for, 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 for this group and this level of intelligence and expertise to operate on multiple, multiple different mm -hmm. platforms, it adds so much cost and it adds so much redundancy. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you can't tell me there's another, there isn't another world where the business faculty, we're seeing this in a guy named um, Dror, Smart Sparrow is the company and Dror, I'm going to forget his name, is the guy who runs it. But it, he's building, their, build, their, their, their special sauce is that they build courses using a network of faculty who yeah. get together and create the course on a common platform across systems. So yeah. the, the, the intelligence of the crowd improves exactly. the quality of the content and no one loses anything. And if you look at this in the product life cycle, we are now, I believe, at the crux of maturity. Yeah. We have built so many courses. We have had so many technologies. What are we doing to ensure that what we're delivering is what our students need, what are designed that are adaptive, what, are, what is it really? And then even with efficiency of uh, data analytics, you're looking at numerics again, and then you're not looking at the qualitative side of it. And I think this is a real challenge to us. I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm saying, okay, I have built more than a hundred courses. Guerrilla tacticking this faculty who refused to do it, I went to all my adjuncts and developed more than a hundred courses. How am I now going to them and tell them, okay guys, are we doing the right thing? Are you updating your courses? What are your learning outcomes? Are these learning outcomes the real readable analytics that will address the needs of our students going forward. I'm, I'm right there. I, you know, so just to add one more challenge, because you're challenging your colleagues, I'll jump in. Um, <clears throat> yeah, common Thank platform. You. Imagine what you could pull off following a master course model. I realize I was, I'm a dyed in the wool faculty member. I, I can do the handshake and I can show you the scars, but you know, the master course actually enables more creative teaching, right? especially because they're adaptive and adaptable. So forget sustainability and efficiency, although I can't. What's the, what's the cost of redundant development of, ro of basic content, right? So between you in this room on a common platform, you can't tell me there's not an opportunity to, to develop and to continuously improve to the network of the most intelligent system level faculty in the country, the best courses, I don't get that. And to enable the most powerful teaching, which after all, then has an opportunity to engage with students, use data, integrate research where that's appropriate. I, you know, I know it's orthogonal, I know it's heretical, but that's when I take these questions about, you know, well, we need more money. I'm like, okay, but are we, are we so convinced that the only model to deliver Quality education is the one we've been doing for 150 years. I do not believe that. In fact, the data suggests it isn't true. One last factoid. Scott Freeman, University of Washington, research scientist, gets into active learning. Nothing to do with online. Active learning is the stuff that I did not do when I was reading my, when I was doing my lecture. Active learning is more like this kind of engagement. Active learning shows an effect size of something like 0.45 in a meta study that he did. Pretty reliable meta study. In the drug industry, if you're not, if you're a hospital and you're not adopting a drug which showing a 0.25 effect size, you are going to get sued for medical malpractice. So I'm sitting here thinking, and I've heard others say this, not just me. When in a public institution, because that's the place to do it, is some kid, some low income kid going to take a suit because they're not engaging in act, because the the institutions not engaging in active learning, active learning shown demonstrably to help low-income students, first-gen students, better, right? When's that, you know, so you talk about change and sort of industry, legal stuff. I'm not taking the suit and I'm not suggesting it happens. But, you know, the, the, the point is, is it, you know, it, the, the, it just, it sometimes astonishes me 
that an, a, a, an industry which is driven by empirical method and will apply empirical method to every force of nature and society is not desperately interested in implying that empir empirical method to learning and learning outcomes and assumes that there is a single way of doing business. So I'm sorry, I'm getting passionate. There was one other question, and then I know you're going to interrupt me. Uh, Did I you? Think, I think we have to wrap, wrap up. it up. I'm sorry, Brandon. Um, and I think you probably are going to be a little bit. Your plane flight, so you're going to be maybe a little bit longer. Yeah. And so if anyone has additional questions for Daniel, uh, we're going to take a break right now. Um, uh, 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 to the online.